Welcome back. In this lecture, we will introduce the engineering energy equation and its application. Energy equations can be extended to include cases the mechanical work is done by the fluid as in the case of a turbine or a windmill or it is done on the fluid as in a pump or a fan. Consider a device with one inlet and one outlet. Introduce a stirrer in this device. Is a device when rotated will do work on the fluid. Let the flow through this control volume be steady, incompressible and inviscid. Further, let there be no thermal action that is there is no input or output of energy as heat and therefore no change in temperature. Let us also assume that the flow at the inlet and outlet is one dimensional that is we have uniform velocity at 1 and 2. Since there are no shear stresses the only work done by the surface forces at the control surface is by the pressure forces at the inlet and outlet and as we showed in the last lecture the rate of this work done by the system is minus P1 A1 V plus P2 A2 V2. P1 A1 V is the work done on the system while pushing the fluid in at the inlet and therefore it is negative. P2 A2 V2 is work done by the system in pushing the material out at the exit and that is why it is positive. Let us assume that the external device on which the system is doing work or which is doing work on the system at a rate of W dot S. The subscript S stands for shaft because this usually is a work through a rotating shaft. Thus W dot S is the rate of doing work by the system. In this case of the shutter W S dot would be negative. So, the total work done by the system then is minus P1 A1 V1 plus P2 A2 V2 plus W S dot. The energy equation for the control volume that we obtained earlier was d e by d t the material rate of change of the energy contained in the system is equal to del e by del t the rate of accumulation of energy within the control volume plus the net efflux and this should be by first law of thermodynamics q dot minus w dot. The capital E the total energy contained within the system can be found out from using the specific energy E that is the energy per unit mass which consists of V square by 2 plus G Z plus U the internal energy. The steady flow requirement states that del E by del T is equal to 0, no accumulation, there is no thermal action so Q dot is 0 and also U at inlet is equal to U at outlet since there is no change in temperature. So, net efflux of E must equal to Q dot minus W dot. Net efflux of E is M dot the rate of mass throughput into V square by 2 plus G Z the specific energy per unit mass at the outlet minus m dot the rate of mass throughput into v square by 2 plus g z at the inlet. This is the net efflux of energy and that should be equal to minus the net work done by the system and that we have shown is minus p 1 a 1 v 1 plus p 2 a 2 v 2 plus w s dot. Now, rho 1 a 1 v 1 
is equal to rho 2 A 2 V 2 for a steady system and that is equal to the rate of mass throughput. And so, that A 1 V 1 is m dot divided by rho 1 and A 2 V 2 is m dot divided by rho 2. Using this, we can divide the energy equation by m dot throughout and we get the relation by rearranging v square by 2 plus g z plus p by rho at the outlet minus the same quantity at the inlet is equal to minus w s dot divided by m dot which is minus lowercase w s dot. Lowercase w s dot is the rate of doing work shaft work by the system per unit mass of fluid throughput. The same equation rewritten. Now, each of the term here has a unit of joules per kilogram. We can divide each terms by g to get an alternate form v square by 2 g plus z plus p by rho g at the exit. These are the sum of the various heads at the exit. v square by 2 g is the kinetic energy head, z is the potential head and p by rho g is what is termed as the pressure head at the exit is equal to the same heads at the inlet minus h s. The work done by the system expressed as per unit weight throughput. Each term has a unit of length in this case. These equations are further extended by considering that the work done by viscous forces as loss of mechanical energy. If there is any work done by viscous forces within the control volume, we will consider, uh, consider that as a loss of mechanical energy. We use W L dot for the energy loss to the viscous forces per unit mass throughput and H L for the head loss for mechanical energy to viscous forces per unit weight throughput. Thus, we can express the final result. The total head at the outlet is equal to total head at the inlet minus H s the head of work done by the shaft minus H l the head loss due to viscous stresses. This is known as the extended Bernoulli equation or engineering energy equation, any of the two names. A general class of fluid mechanical problem, for example, those involving fluid machineries like pumps, turbines, etc., consists of cases where the fluid field is not exactly steady but is changing cyclically because of a rotating shaft. Thus, the equation above should hold with the understanding that all quantities are now averaged over a rotational cycle. We introduce now the concept of hydraulic and energy grade lines. Consider a converging diverging channel with a liquid flowing in this. Simple application of Bernoulli equation would show that as the fluid moves down this converging diverging channel. In the converging portion, the velocities would be increasing and so the pressure would be decreasing. In the diverging portion, the velocities would be decreasing and the pressure would be increasing. Thus, the piezometric tubes that are attached to the channel would show a level of water first decreasing and then increasing as shown. This represents the variation of piezometric head along the length of the channel. It represents z plus p by rho g. This is called the hydraulic grade line in 
civil engineering. There is another concept, the energy grade line, which is shown horizontal constant across this section because there are no losses and there is no shaft work done. So, the Bernoulli equation would require that the total energy, the kinetic plus potential plus the pressure would be constant. So, the variations in this case are only in the hydraulic grade line, the energy grade line is constant. An interesting property of this grade line is that the both the hydraulic grade line and the engineering grade line do not depend upon the inclination of the channel. If the channel were inclined at an angle as shown, as you go up the channel, the elevation head would increase, but the pressure head would decrease accordingly. So, that the hydraulic grid line would have exactly the same shape as before and as would the energy grid line. Let us do an example of plotting the hydraulic grid line and energy grid line in flow over a wear. In an open channel, we have an obstruction we call a wear and the flow is taking place above the wear. like we did in the last lecture. This is one approximation to the flow that we can take. I draw a line at 45 degrees. At any height y above the crest of the wear, the arrow here shows the elevation head. Since this line is 45 degrees, this horizontal line marked elevation head is exactly equal to the height of this point above the base. So, this the pressure head all across this jet of water that emerges over the wear is atmospheric all through and so the pressure head is assumed 0. We talk about the gauge pressure. The hydraulic grid line then looks like this because pressure head is 0. So, the elevation head line and the hydraulic grade line would be same. The hydraulic head is maximum here and is minimum here. Now, since the water is coming from a reservoir which is essentially at rest, the total energy along any streamline is the same. So, at every point along this line, the total energy is the same. And so, the energy grade line would be a straight line. At the top, the velocity is 0, and so the total energy is the hydraulic head plus the velocity head. So, same point. And this is the energy grid line. Clearly, the shaded area represents the velocity head. The velocity head is 0 at the top and is maximum at the bottom, varying linearly. I plotted here the hydraulic and the energy grid line in a converging diverging channel. In the first picture on the left, we have a channel in which there is a short converging portion and a very long diverging portion. The total energy shown by a blue line is constant. As the flow, flow travels downstream, the velocity increases and so the pressure decreases. And then after the throat, since the air is increasing, the velocity decreases and the pressure increases. The red line 
shows the hydraulic grid line pressure plus the elevation. The elevation is constant. So, the pressure line itself is the hydraulic grid line. The shaded portion represents the velocity head, the difference between the energy grid line and the hydraulic grid line. This picture changes drastically. If the diverging portion of the channel is short, as we have discussed a couple of times earlier, now that the boundary layer forms along the channel separates at the throat in the diverging portion and the liquid comes out as a jet. And since the liquid comes out as a jet, its velocity does not in does not decrease and so the pressure does not increase. As the red line here shows, the pressure does not recover back to its original value at the inlet. There is a loss of pressure. The jet ultimately fills the channel and the kinetic energy of this jet is then dissipated and is lost. The same principle is used in the design of wind tunnels. A wind tunnel is a structure to test aerodynamic phenomena, aircraft parts or similar things in a fluid flow. When the aircraft moves in a stationary atmosphere, the forces that is experienced are the same. When the aircraft is stationary and the air moves past this. So, we use this principle to construct a wind tunnel. In this test section of the wind tunnel, we mount a model of the aircraft part that we want to test and we create a flow in this channel. This flow is created by a fan in this portion which sucks air. The inlet of this tunnel is designed such that the flow that we obtain in the test section is uniform and straight. This flow needs to slow down at the fan. And so, the diverging length termed the diffuser is much longer than the converging length. This is to prevent the separation of the flow in the diverging portion. These wind tunnels can be small or can be big. One of a very big tunnel exists in IIT Kanpur, where in the National Wind Tunnel Facility, we have a closed circuit wind tunnel. The fan sucks in air and flows, the air slows down, it bends along, it goes again. The screens in this inlet section are there to make the flow smooth. The air is speeded up in this nozzle and this is a test section where the parts that we want to study the flow on are mounted with proper instrumentation. The flow then slows down in the increasing section 
and is recirculated. The recirculation is there essentially to save energy. Let us apply the engineering Bernoulli equation to a pump. In this example, a pump is used to pump water through a height. The pump picks up water from this tank to this pipe and the water is now pushed through a pipe at a section A2 at a height. Let us take a control volume shown by this broken lines. Assuming it compressible and steady flow with negligible heat transfer, we can apply the engineering Bernoulli equation to the control volume shown. The steadiness of the flow through rotating machinery here is in the context of the quantities averaged over one rotation of the impeller as discussed earlier. So, the applicable equation is the engineering Bernoulli equation or the extended energy equation. Here we know at one the inlet, the surface of the tank from where the water is coming from. If the cross sectional area A1 is very large compared to the area A2, then the velocity at one is negligible. Z1 is taken to be 0. We define the datum there. Z2 is given. We know the height to which we are pumping water. P1 and P2 are both P atmospheric. Let us neglect the losses. So, WL dot is taken as 0. Now, we are given m dot the mass flow rate through the pump and know the diameter of the system. We can determine v 2 the velocity through the pipe. Let us assume the whole pipe has the same diameter. So, the velocity throughout the pipe is v 2 the velocity at the exit. We are to find the power consumed by the pump in, in pumping m dot kilogram per second of water to the height h. W s is what we want to calculate and then we can find out capital W s dot is equal to m dot lowercase w s dot. Recall that lowercase w s dot is the work done per unit mass throughput while capital w s dot is the total work done per unit time by the system. Let us plot the hydraulic and the energy grade line. Let z is equal to 0 represents the datum. Then the total head. Total head up to the inlet is constant and is 0 because at 1 the pressure is 0, z elevation is 0, the velocity is 0. So, that the total head is 0. And since along any streamline from here to any point within this pipe, we can apply Bernoulli equation. So, the total head remains the same at 0.
the pump increases the head, pump does work on the system. So, H S is negative and that increases the head of the fluid as the total head is now in the exit pipe is at an elevated level. This is H S. the head supplied by the pump. It is actually a negative quantity because this is the work done on the system. Since the pipe has a constant diameter, the velocity is constant throughout the pipe and so the velocity head is a horizontal line. Clearly, the piezometric head which is the sum of the elevation head and the pressure head is equal to the total head minus the velocity head. So, piezometric head is a line which is below the total head line by an amount equal to the velocity head there. And this line then represents the piezometric head. We have negative piezometric head through the inlet pipe and the positive piezometric head at the outlet pipe. The pressure head, pressure head and the elevation head together makes the piezometric head. So, pressure head we can obtain by subtracting the elevation from the piezometric head. This elevation we subtract from the piezometric head to get this broken line. This is the pressure head. Let us take another example. It concerns a hydroelectric project where the water is stored up behind a dam. That water is directed through a tube or a pipe or a channel known as penstock to a turbine. It extracts energy from the water and the resulting flow passes through the end of the penstock into atmosphere. Let us draw the total energy line and the hydraulic line for this. Let us consider this as a relevant control volume with one in inlet at 1 where the velocity can be assumed to be 0, the pressure is 0, the elevation head is h, net 2 where there is a velocity, the pressure is 0, the atmospheric and the elevation is 0 since we take the datum there. Let H s be the head extracted by the turbine and convert it to work. So, neglecting viscous losses in the pipe, the engineering Bernoulli equation requires V square by 2 g plus z plus p by rho g at the outlet 2 is equal to the total head at the inlet minus H s the head extracted by the turbine. This is the work done by the system. So, H s is positive. Let the velocity at point 2 be V. So, the first of V square by 2 g at the exit is V square by 2 g. Z is 0, pressure is 0 that equals velocity 0 at point 1, the elevation capital H at point 1, the pressure is 0 at point 1 minus H s the head extracted. So, we get head extracted is equal to capital H minus 
v square by 2 g. This we could have seen directly. From the total head H available in the reservoir, we extract all of it in the turbine except for the head of kinetic energy that the water emerges with at point 2. Thus, H s is equal to capital H minus V square by 2 g is the energy extracted per unit weight of the fluid passing through. The weight passing through per second is rho V a times g. V a is the volume passing through rho V a gives you the mass passing through per unit time and multiplied by g will give you the weight of water passing through per unit time. So, the power output is rho V a g times H s which is rho a g capital H V into 1 minus V square by twice G H. Now, this is an interesting expression. Here as V increases this increases, but this decreases. So, one part increases, the other part decreases. When V is equal to 0, clearly the power would be 0. When V is equal to under root 2 G H, that is all the head from the reservoir is now available as a kinetic head that is no head is being extracted. Then this term becomes 0. So, there must be a maxima somewhere in between. Here the term 1 minus v square by twice g h represents the fraction of the total available head which is extracted by the turbine. We plot here the non dimensional velocity v by under root twice g h against the non dimensional power developed by the system. And we notice that there is a maximum power available. We non dimensionalize the power output w s dot with rho a g h raised to power 3 by 2. This is the total power that would be available if we extract all of this out from the system. And we non dimensional velocity by under root twice g h, which would be the velocity if the total head is converted into velocity. And so, we get a non dimensional power w s dot star equal to under root 2 v star into 1 minus v star square where v star is v by under root twice g h. So, the velocity for the maximum power we can determine is v star is equal to under root 1 by root 3 and the maximum power output non dimensional is w s star is equal to 0 0.543. We plot the energy grid line and the hydraulic grid line for this hydropower setup and we do this in inclined coordinate system. Let z 0 line represents the datum, the elevation head, the pressure head. We as we go down the pressure increases in the turbine the pressure becomes negative after a while and then it increases in the tail rays. The hydraulic grid line is then the sum of the pressure head and the elevation head. The hydraulic grid line here is a constant value. The velocity head is constant through the pipe if we assume the diameter of the penstock and the tail race is constant. The total head is the energy, the hydraulic grid line plus the velocity head.
through the pipe. Head extracted by the turbine is shown here. Let's do another example of flow in a ducted fan operating in a duct with a smooth bell shaped entrance. This fan sucks in air from all around and the air exits as a jet. Given the cross sectional area and given the fan power, calculate the air flow rate. That is the problem. So, we assume this control volume, we assume a very large area at the end. The air is coming from all sides. The pressure is atmospheric there and the velocity is very small because the area is very large. If the air velocity within the duct is not very large, the flow can be considered as incompressible. Averaged over one rotation of the fan, the flow can be taken steady. We neglect the viscous losses. The flow meets all the requirements of the engineering Bernoulli equation. And so, we apply this equation v square by 2 g at the exit, z at the exit is 0, p at the exit is 0 is equal to v square by 2 g at the inlet is 0, the elevation z is 0, pressure at the inlet is 0 again minus h s. So, this gives you v square is equal to minus twice g h s. Since the fan does work on air, h s is negative. h s is the head supplied by the fan. Let us plot the variations of the heads. The total head up to fan is 0 because the total head here is 0 up till here up till the fan there is no input of energy and if we neglect viscous losses the total head would remain 0 there. The fan supplies a head h s and so in the remaining part of the tube behind the fan the total head is this. The pressure head z is same, so pressure head is same as the hydro is the piezometric head. So, pressure head line is the same as the hydraulic grade line and it is obtained by subtracting the velocity head from the total head. The velocity starts out at 0 here, it increases and then becomes constant in this duct. So, the pressure head looks like this showed here. From the total head line, we subtract the velocity head. In this portion, the velocity is increasing up to the inlet and after that, the velocity is constant. Ideal velocity head. If there was viscosity present, there would be losses against the walls of the duct and the total head would decrease constantly. This broken line shows the decrease in total head. The pressure would also decrease constantly along this and so the real pressure head would be this broken red line and the real velocity head is this. Let us do one more concept called the kinetic energy correction factor. We have so far assumed that the flow through the inlet and outlet are one dimensional. That is, we assumed that there are 
no variations in the velocity across the inlet and the outlet sections. But there actually are. This can be taken care of by using a kinetic energy correction factor. So, we calculate the kinetic energy flux by using the average velocity and then we multiply it by a correction factor to find out the actual kinetic energy flux. If we have a circular pipe of radius r, then the one dimensional assumption would require that we assume the velocity is the average velocity all across the pipe section. So, V average V A V is the average throughout the pipe, the mass flow rate would be rho V average times pi r square and then kinetic energy per unit mass at the average velocity is taken as V average square divided by 2. So, this is the kinetic energy flux with one dimensional assumption. Now, let us assume a laminar flow. In a laminar flow, the velocity profile is given as V is equal to V max into 1 minus R star square, where R star is R by capital R, the radius of the inlet pipe. We have shown earlier that V max is twice the V average. Now, the actual kinetic energy flux would be obtained by considering a ring of thickness dr at radius r. The kinetic energy through this is mass flow through this, which is twice pi r V dr times the kinetic energy of this which is one half V square per unit mass. And so, this is simplified to pi rho times pi times integral 0 to r V cube r T r. So, we define gamma the kinetic energy correction factor as the actual kinetic energy flux shown in the numerator divided by the kinetic energy flux with one dimensional assumption which is obtained in the last slide. And this simplifies to twice integral 0 to 1 V by V average whole cubed R star dr star where R star is R divided by capital R the radius of the pipe. Now, we can go the lamina or the turbulent route. For the lamina flow, V is equal to V max 1 minus R star square. V average is 1 half V max and V divided by V average is twice into 1 minus R star square. The above integration yields gamma the kinetic energy correction factor as 2. We could use turbulent flow also and in turbulent flow most commonly used velocity profile is the 1 7th power law profile. V is equal to V max into 1 minus R star raised to power 1 7. V average turns out to be 0 0.817 V max and V divided by V average is given by 0 0.817 into 1 minus r star raised to power 1 by 7. This yields gamma is equal to 1.058. The kinetic energy correction factor for turbulent flow is very small compared to 1. So, we might as well not used the kinetic energy fraction in the case of turbulent flow. As was mentioned earlier, most pipe flows of commercial interest are turbulent and so they probably 
is no need of using kinetic, kinetic energy correction factors. Thank you.